Open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Last week we began uh, looking at this great book and, and the initial cause of captivity. That was the, the, the kind of the theme as we were looking at that. Um, and we saw, if you weren't here with us or didn't watch it, um, we saw that the, the enemy employs tactics, even, even within the sovereignty of God, right? God allowed this whole thing, it's discipline. Uh, but uh, in the captivity, we also see the, the, the tactics of the enemy, and they were isolation, indoctrination, compromise, and confusion. At least that was my outline from last week. As we continue these lessons, we're going to focus on that whole idea of compromise. And, and really the only way to combat it. And that is by faith. I mean, that's the thing that we see over and over and over again as we're looking at, at Daniel and uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We're seeing faith. They're trusting God with their lives. Let's go ahead and read uh, Daniel 1. Uh, we're going to read verses 8 through 21, so the rest of the chapter. It says, But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink, for why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer who commanded, uh, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. And let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youth who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. Verse 14, so he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who, were, who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine uh, they were to drink, and he kept giving them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. The first thing I want to look at, again, we're, we're looking at Daniel's faith, and when we're looking at Daniel's faith, his friends are included in that, although it seems from uh, the, all the stories, Daniel is a leader amongst them. Daniel's faith is a faith that accepts no compromise. Again, we talked about this last week in the you know, in the outline that I had, the, the idea that um, it would be a compromise for him to have eaten the food, the, the king's choice food. This would have been a compromise of the dietary laws. There's also a sense that it would have been just a, an indulgence, right? This is, the, this is the best food, the very best of the best foods, 
luxurious foods. And, and, and there is this idea that perhaps this was just kind of a way to indoctrinate and to further uh, bring them into the Babylonian lifestyle. It was an indulgence. There's also the possibility, the very real possibility, that this food, the king's choice food, certainly the meat and the wine, would have been offered to their false gods in a sacrificial way. You know, they, they kind of blessed the food in that way. This would have been, all of this would have been, in Daniel's mind, it would have been sin. All of these things would have defiled him. The word defiled here means to make unclean, to make someone unclean. Now, it's not as though Daniel was sinless, right? Uh, there's, not, there's not a lot we're given in the book where we go, oh, yeah, Daniel failed there, Daniel failed there. That, that, that's not here. But we know Daniel's not a sinless guy. But he desired to be undefiled. What a great goal, right? Unfortunately, sometimes I, you probably come across this. I've come across this so many times where Christians are looking for, how far can I take it? What a great goal this is. It's not how far can I, what can I get away with? It's like, no, my goal, the desire of my heart is to be undefiled, to live in an undefiled way. It's a great goal. And it says, Daniel made up his mind. I think, that's, I think that's the most important phrase in this text. I think it's, it's worthy uh, of, of really just considering. Daniel made up his mind. Before any other bit of information is given, Daniel resolved to not compromise there was probably a great deal of pressure on him. Certainly there was pressure from the Babylonians. I mean, this is the command of the king. The king says, hey, listen, I'm going to take you guys for three years. We're going to, first, first of all, you're isolated. Second of all, now here's this food you're going to eat. Here's an education we're going to give you. We're going to indoctrinate you in all things Babylon. Here's the best of the best of the food. There's pressure to conform. And certainly, even as we see this exchange, these leaders who are serving Nebuchadnezzar, they, it's like, Daniel, come on, get with the program, you guys. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like people just want you to get with the program? Shut up and get with the program. Sometimes that comes from your brethren. We don't know a whole lot about the interaction that they had with the other Hebrew youth, but it needs to be, they're mentioned here. There, there's something that we ought to keep in mind. There's other Hebrew youth who don't, who don't care about these things. They haven't determined, right? They haven't made up their mind, hey, we're not going to, yeah, we're not going to partake in that stuff. I wonder what they said to him. Oh, come on. Oh, come on, Daniel. Come on, you guys. What, what's the big deal? So what that they've changed our names? We're still Hebrews. All right, so what that they've... Oh, so what that they're... Okay, we have to go to class. We're going to class, and they're, they're teaching us about all the, the dark things of the Chaldeans. We're, te we're learning about their sorcery and their, their dark arts. Oh, so what? Big deal. Come on. Well, come on, Daniel. These are just dietary laws. No one cares about these things. It's just, it's incidental. These aren't big sins, right? You can just hear them. This is what people do. This is what our own brethren do sometimes. None of it means anything. If it was in our context, people would be saying, oh, Romans 13. We got we to gotta obey. We got to submit to the government. They would say that. That's what they say. Daniel made up his mind. And here's why he made up his mind. He knew, as we went through last week, the cause of captivity. And the cause of captivity was disobedience to the Word of God. 
And it was over those very same things. Oh, come on. What's the deal with the Sabbath? What's the deal with letting the land life out? Oh, what's the deal with kind of engaging with some of the cultural gods and things like that? Come on. And this led to 70 years of captivity. Daniel knew that. The cause of captivity was rooted in disobedience to the word of God. And this needs to be the guiding principle. Certainly, any time the government of man and the word of God come into conflict, as believers, we need to ask the question, what does God say? What does his word say? Remember when the disciples were ordered to stop preaching in the name of Jesus? In Acts chapter 4, it says they commanded them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Authority being exerted over these early disciples or apostles. It says Peter and John answered them and said, Well, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Jesus, Jesus gave them the gospel. He saved them, caused them to be born again. And here they are, they're preaching the, the message of the kingdom. They're telling people about Jesus. And the government or, or the leaders say, hey, 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 stop that. With respect, sir. You know, it's like, it, it's between you and God. It, it, whether or not we do this, we're going to do what the Lord told us to do. This, we're going to be obedient to the word of God. Now, isn't it interesting This compromise, this compromise in regard to food, in regard to diet, it's the original compromise. It was over food. But really, food was never the issue. I, I like, uh, if you guys know who Emerson Egerich is, he has that love and respect ministry, he, he always has, he uses this line, he says, what's the issue when the issue's not the issue? It's like sometimes you got to drill down, it's like, what's the issue? Is the issue food? Is the issue diet? No. The issue's not food. The issue's not diet. Obedience to the word of God is the issue. That was the issue in the garden. God gave his word. Eve was tempted with food. Food wasn't the issue. Here's the number one key to living in Babylon. Obey the word of God. Obey the word of God and don't give in to compromise, right, to the, to the cultural pressure to disregard it. The battle, the battle has to do with the word of God. And you need to make up your mind. I, I love this. this. This speaks to me so directly that Daniel simply made up his mind. I'm not going to compromise. In Joshua chapter 24, we, uh, you know, Joshua 24, Joshua has, has given the, the children of Israel, really God using Joshua, has given the children of Israel the promised land. They, they have come in and, and they, have, they have conquered. They have taken over the promised land. And Joshua is about to die here at the end of, uh, of the, the book. Uh, he's 110 years old. And, and he's, he's speaking to the people. He's, he's given them his, this whole history lesson, said, God has done this and God has done this and God has done this and God has done this. But he's concerned about the future. And, and he presses the people to make a decision. You know, you, some of you, you, you'll know this, this passage. It says, he says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. 
If it's disagreeable in your sight uh, to serve the Lord, choose for yourself today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He made up his mind. And he's asking the people, make up your mind. It's important. It's important. Make up your mind. He says, you, you want to serve the God of the Amorites? I mean, really, what he's referring there to is all the people they had just conquered. Their false gods were not able to deliver them. And God had just given them great victory, years of victory after victory after victory. They took the promised land that God promised to Abraham. You want to go, you want to go serve those guys? You want to serve their gods? You decide. But me, my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Friends, you have to resolve to do that. You have to resolve to be that person. Now, no, it, it doesn't mean that you're relying on your own strength, but you need to make up your mind. And, and he, he tells them, listen, in this whole idea of serving the Lord, he says, first of all, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. You need to have a proper understanding of who you are and who he is. You're not him. He's God. And we should have proper reverence and respect for Him. He says, serve Him in sincerity and truth. Sincerity, honestly, before Him, in truth. Where do we get the truth? Here. If you're going to serve Him, you must do it according to the truth. Put away these gods. The gods are the compromise. Make up your mind you're going to do that. I love, I love that. Joshua just says, well, I'm, you can do what you want. I'm going to serve the Lord. If you've not resolved in your heart to obey God, you've resolved in your heart to disobey Him. Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 30. He said, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. People like to take some kind of a neutral, it's like, well, you know, Jesus is cool and all that, but I'm not really sure. No, if you're not with me, if you're not with me, you're against me. If you're not, if you're not gathering with me, in other words, if you're not part of the program, then you're, you're, like, you're going to be end, ended up being part of the group that scatters. You're not going to be helpful. Daniel had a faith that accepted no compromise. Great example. He also has a faith, as we look at this text, that seeks to cause no unnecessary offense. This is a really important one, and it might, it might seem like a little deal, but I actually think it's a, it's, a, it's a very important thing, especially in our day. Look at, look at verse uh, 9. It says, He sought permission... He sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Even in verse 12, as he's proposing this diet plan, he says, please. Now, now there are times as Christians where, where we need to stand forcefully. Right? We need to take a stand forcefully. Other times, other times, we need to be gentle. Daniel wasn't, he wasn't asking permission to obey the Lord. He wasn't asking permission for that. He already made up his mind. I'm going to obey the Lord. I, I, uh, he made up his mind. But he took this tone. It's like, I, I don't, I don't want to be defiled by those things. They're offensive. I'm, I'm a Hebrew. And so he took this seemingly more passive tone in his request. You know, Babylon presents so many things that are offensive. When I, when I say Babylon, I'm talking about the context here of, of Daniel's life, but also keep in mind your life, our life, our Babylon, our culture. There are so many things that are offensive. There's the worship of false gods. There's the, just the, that idol worship. There's just the, the celebrated sin and, and debauchery. We should be, 
we are and should be offended every single day by the things we hear, by the things we see. But how we respond to it really matters. And I think oftentimes we find ourselves responding to it improperly in ways that are not helpful. The tragic story in the news this week, of course, was the, this mass killing on Tuesday, this 21-year-old man, who, by the way, claims to be a Christian, went into these three massage parlors and, and killed eight people. Now, he's obviously deeply disturbed. He claims that it was because of his sex addiction. This is what caused him to lash out against, you know, this particular part of our society. There's no excuse, right? There's no excuse for what this guy did. But I kind of get it. You know, a little bit. We live in a place where sexual sin, sexual debauchery is promoted, it's celebrated, and and you can't escape it. And if you want to live your life, especially as a guy, if you want to live your life in an undefiled way, it's it's impossible. It's, It's just impossible. You'd have to be blind. It's frustrating. It's very, very frustrating because the same culture that promotes and celebrates and pushes this cultural sickness. And this this guy, he's just a symptom of a greater cultural sickness. Again, I'm not excusing what he did, but I understand some of the frustration that people have. It is frustrating because the same culture, right, they they deny. They deny that it's a sickness, even while celebrating it. They deny the sickness. They deny how corrupt it is. And then they also deny the only remedy because the only remedy is the gospel. People's lives need to be changed. That's the only hope. It's like, oh, no, anything with that. It's frustrating. It's even more frustrating that this young man, evidently in his religious training, he believed that he could battle sin. You know, that by killing people, by taking up, you know, arms, he could fight sin in that way. That's not the way it works. And it ended in tragedy. I think we can sometimes miss the important lessons of how it is we are to fight. Because we we are called to fight, but not like that. I love these Old Testament stories. I referenced Joshua, and I I loved going through that study with the young men. I love the Old Testament stories of conquest. They're they're important. They're vital. And, And, you know, and they teach us over and over and over again in many different ways that our God is victorious. You guys know the the story of David and Goliath. Such a wonderful story. It's such a great, uh, you know, beautiful story to take in. When David went out to meet Goliath, it was in the context of war. Right? The the army of Israel and the army of the Philistines, they were gathered together. And and because of the giant, all the all the warriors in Israel's army, they were afraid. They're like, who can come against this guy? This guy's crazy. We can't, we can't battle him. And then here comes the little shepherd boy, the teenage David. He went out to meet Goliath. It was war. And there was bloodshed. There were weapons involved and there was bloodshed. But even while the context of that is literal war, the lesson is not, the, the takeaway for us is not, hey, this is how you, you know, we should go out and kill our enemies physically. Right? That's, that's not the takeaway. Hello. 
In fact, David, by his own words, gives us the lesson. When he went out to battle, we always need to remember what he said. He said, and, and that all this assembly, he's preaching here, everyone's listening to him, may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And that's the great lesson of David's exploits there. And, and really, all these lessons in the Old Testament where God was the conqueror and God gave the victory to Israel. It wasn't, you know, the lesson is not, hey, go out and kill your enemies. It's that God does the, the fighting. It's his battle. In Psalm 44, verse 6, it says, I will not trust in my bow, nor will my sword save me. The prophet Zechariah said, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So important for us to remember, there is a battle, right? There is a battle, but, but we're not told to, to, to go out to war in the weapons of the world. Rather, we're to be surrendered to God. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul puts it this way. He says, though we walk in the flesh, metaphor for life, right? That's a metaphor for just living. We walk in the flesh. Though we live in Babylon, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Totally effective. They're just not the tools. They're just not the weapons that the world uses. It, this might seem, this whole idea that, that Daniel was gentle in his request for permission, even saying please, it might seem like a little thing. It's a major thing. In fact, I think this is the whole game. This is the whole game. The entire battle, and it's this. Daniel trusted God. He trusted God. Even while he made up his mind, I am not going to comply. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Like he already made up his mind. I'm not going to do that. Yet he took this gracious tone. He didn't start a cancel Nebuchadnezzar campaign. Right? There was no hashtag movement. He didn't seek to escape. It's like, I'm not going to do this. But he took this gracious tone. The victory that God wants us to have is not one that seeks to destroy our enemies, right? And we have to avoid that mindset. No, what God wants to do is destroy our flesh, right? And, and have us trust in Him. We have to surrender, or surrender ourselves fully to Him. The faith that seeks to cause no unnecessary offense. That was Daniel's faith. He didn't, he didn't want to cause trouble. He just wanted to obey the Lord. And it says God granted Daniel favor. It worked. God, Look at verse 9. God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. Paul told us in Colossians 4, he says, conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you'll know how you should respond to each person. What a great guiding principle. The church needs to learn this. We need to remember this. In our conduct with outsiders, and I would say even in our conflict with outsiders, be gracious. Be gracious in the way you talk. Let your speech always be with grace, even as seasoned with salt, and that it has a preservative nature to it. Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Daniel had a faith that accepts no compromise. He had a faith that sought to cause no unnecessary offense. His faith rested in the power of God. And so he proposes this test. Have you ever had an idea that was crazy? Probably. I've had some crazy ideas. 
Like as a pastor, I've had some crazy ideas. Hey, maybe the church could do this. And sometimes people laugh at me. I've, I've had some people laugh at me. And some of my ideas are stupid. But I don't mind. Because I believe in a God who can do anything. Like I do, I believe. I believe in, in a God who can do anything. And I think uh, on some level, we all ought to have kind of crazy ideas. I believe in the God of Daniel. Some of my, some of my favorite characters in the Old Testament are Jonathan. Saul's son, Jonathan, and, and Caleb. They have this phrase that they both use that it's been with me since I was a baby Christian. They both said, perhaps the Lord. Perhaps the Lord. And, and, and in the context, both of them were crazy ideas. I think we could do this. And they did. They did. God used them. They went out and did great things by faith. Here's what Daniel proposes. We don't, I don't want to be defiled. I don't want to eat the king's food. Hey, here's the, how about if we do a test? How about if we do a test for 10 days? And, 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 and we're just going to eat vegetables and water. It's like, I'm out already, Daniel. This is a stupid idea. <laughs> we're going to eat vegetables and water and, and let those other guys, those other guys who don't seem to care, they can eat the king's choice food. And then after 10 days, you can examine us. Oh, this is a good plan, Daniel. You know, there's been many books written, diet programs initiated, right? Because of this, we're always, we're always looking for some biblical diet. It's the Daniel diet. Google it. You'll find there's tons of them. The Daniel diet, 10 days to a new you. Actually, actually, a lot of the books and things are called the Daniel Fast, but for some reason, it needs to be 40 days. <laughs> the thing is, again, this isn't about the diet. It's not about what they eat. It's not about what they're drinking or eating. It's about trusting God. Again, it's about trusting God and His Word. Daniel was an observant Jew. He wanted to be obedient to the law. This is what God required of his people. And yet, even within that context, we understand that what God was looking for in his people was faith expressed in obedience. In that regard, nothing's changed. Nothing's different, right? right? Uh, I'm thankful. I'm thankful as a New Testament Christian that the Bible has declared all foods are clean. Can I get an amen? Amen. All the lovers of king crab. A hearty amen. You know, it, it pulled pork. Whatever, I'm getting hungry. No, uh, it's just, I'm, I'm thankful for that. But God's called us the very same kind of thing. A walk of faith. Dependence upon Him and a faith that's evidenced in obedience to His Word. Daniel understood that the battle was the Lord's. And it wasn't about the vegetables. Because this plan, it doesn't even make sense. Like, if you're looking for, you know, in the context of this, fatness was a good thing. If you're looking for the young people to look healthy, as in meat on the bones, and, 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 and all of that, it's like, this doesn't really make it vegetables and water versus the king's choice food, hello? It doesn't really make any sense. See, Daniel was trusting God. It was God who gave him favor, and it was God who would give the outcome. When Daniel proposed the test, I would say he already passed his. Because his test was a test of faith. Daniel, do you trust me? Yes, Lord, I trust you. I trust your word. Your word says, hey, uh, as a Hebrew, I'm not supposed to eat these foods. I don't want to eat these foods. So here we go. Here's the, here's the test. Now, another thing that I want to point out before we move on, don't miss this. 
This faith that Daniel had, and I would just say faith in general, walking by faith in general, it's dangerous. Don't miss that. Resting in the power of God means that in all matters of life and death, we trust Him. The very life of the commander was at stake. Like, it's easy to kind of read and just go, yeah, 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 yeah. Daniel certainly understood this. He's captive. There's this guy that's re referred to over and over again, the king, the king, Nebuchadnezzar. This guy, he had the power of life and death in his hands. Whom he wanted to kill, he could just simply kill. Look at what the commander says in verse 10. He says, I'm afraid. After this test is proposed, he says, I'm afraid of my lord, the king. He's the one who's appointed your food and drink. This is his, this is his orders. And now you're asking me to kind of set those aside and do this Daniel diet? He could have my head. He says, you would make me forfeit my head to the king. That's a very real thing. Like, it's, it's, you know, it's not pretend. It's not like, I'm going to get in trouble. I might get fired. I'm, I get killed. And, and not just him. There was probably a whole team under him who would have all been going against the command of the king. I'm sure Daniel understood all that. And even, I suppose, probably even for these four, they could have probably gotten killed or at least been in further trouble. Walking by faith and being obedient to God sometimes put you, puts you at odds with men, and it can be dangerous. Again, when Daniel proposed this plan, he was completely trusting the power of God for the outcome. I think sometimes for us, our faith changes a bit when death is on the line. It's like we trust God for all kinds of things, I don't, I'm not sure if I trust him for that. I was talking about our trip to Israel that's going to happen in February, God willing. The question that comes up over and over again whenever we're talking about this kind of travel, like, uh, people, people say, and maybe it's been you, no shame, but people say, is it safe? I think it's safe. In fact, those of us who have been there, I feel more safe there than I would in some of our inner cities. Is it safe? I don't know. I don't know if it's safe. But if you're trusting God, sometimes, sometimes the walk of faith will take you into places where you're, you, you might be at some risk. God calls us to things that might seem risky or dangerous. But faith, faith has to disregard those things. My life is in God's hands. Daniel understood. He, he was trusting God to come through in this moment. Even though life was clearly on the line. I think we, we all need a challenge, especially us who live in the Western world. We should have a, a faith that's willing to take some risks in obedience to God. I'm not saying be stupid. Like if, like if Israel, if it was a war zone right now, we probably wouldn't go. That would be kind of silly. But in general, the things that we do sometimes are risky. We trust God. Finally, Daniel's faith is a faith that is victorious. They say that proof is in the pudding. You've probably heard that phrase. I don't know what the or or origin of it was, but you know the whole idea is there's a lot of ingredients in the pudding and you don't really know until you taste it. You test it, you taste it. And you see, and hopefully, it's good. In verse 15, it says, At the end of ten days, their appearance seemed better. They were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. The result of the test, the result of this 10-day test, where, where, where Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were eating vegetables and water only, and the other guys were eating the king's choice food, at the end of that, 
They didn't just look as good as the other guys. They looked better. Again, this is, this is not the diet plan. It's, it's not about the diet. Right? This is the power of God. He's able to do it. He is victorious in the story. And so, after the initial examination, the commander just says, you guys look better than them. We're going to keep you on the diet plan. We're going to keep this program because it's actually working. He was probably thinking, now I'm not, I'm not only am I not going to get killed, I may get a promotion. These guys look better. And as the story continues, we see eventually, it says uh, in verse 18, at the end of the days which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 5 tells us the whole program was for three years. So evidently, this is at the end of three years. The, 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 the term for their indoctrination, their education in all things Chaldean, the, the term for them to be fattened up and made healthy with the king's diet, all of this stuff, this had, this had been completed. And so they go before the king. This is, the, this is the test, in his eyes at least. And, and of course, there's, there's some, you know, this wasn't really a beauty pageant, but certainly the physical examination was part of it. Do these guys look healthy? They ought to look healthy. And, and of course, if they didn't, someone's in trouble. But then it says in verse 18, he talked with them. So the examination was physical, but it was also you know, an interview. He examined them. He gave them some kind of a test, probably asked them questions about different things. And again, these four Hebrew youth who did not compromise, they were better. Verse 19 tells us no one was found. No one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were, they were better than the Hebrew youth, and notice they were, they were ten times better than the, the Chaldeans and the, the conjurers. These are the counselors of the king. These are the guys, when the king needed wisdom, they didn't have, he had, he had this cohort of smart guys. And he would call them in for wisdom. They were better. Ten times better. Isn't it interesting that what was initially a ten-day diet plan, ended up with them being ten times better than the best. It says in verse 17, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. And God even gave Daniel a special gift to understand dreams and visions. As we turn the page to chapter 2, we'll see right away this comes in handy. God totally uses this gift that he gives them, gives him. In Proverbs 18, 16, it says, A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. This was certainly true of Daniel. Here he is. He, he, he's now, it says, all of them entered into the king's service. How did this happen? God did it. God brought them into this place of prominence, and he used them. And he used Daniel in an incredible way to speak to this king. God used all of them. They were a witness to the king. They were a witness to the commanders, all the Babylonian leaders. We don't have all the details. I wish we had some details. Don't you wish sometimes you could go back and interview certain people in the Bible and go, tell me about that aspect. It's like I want to know how the witness of Daniel and his friends, how that played out in the halls of power, not just with Nebuchadnezzar, but with all these other guys who were right there and watched it all, front row. Here's the thing. People are watching you. Do you know that? People are watching you. I remember, I would like to tell this story because it's one that I always think about in regard to our just kind of lifestyle witness. I remember, you know, many, many years ago when I, used to work for Bartels and was in management. And 
Uh, part of my job was checking in freight, you know. You got to be responsible for the freight that comes in the door, making sure that what you were paid for and what you paid for and what you received lines up. And I remember we had this big shipment of sunglasses that came in. And, you know, sunglasses are kind of a pricey item in a drugstore. And, um, and I remember I just checked it in like normal. I got the invoice and checked it off. Blah, blah, blah. And it co- turns out we had a couple of extra boxes of sunglasses. Somehow, someone made a mistake and they sent us a couple extra boxes of sunglasses. It was a few hundred dollars. Now, if you understand retail, you know that's bank, man. That's, that's profit. Like if you sell those things that cost you nothing, your bottom line is increased and that's what you're in business for. But what would happen in this case is the salesman would come in later and then he would stock the whole little, you know, it was one of those twin displays. You remember those things? And as he was stocking it, as he came to get the merchandise to put it out, I told him, I said, hey, by the way, whatever his name was, Frank, I said, you know, I checked in that shipment. We got a couple extra boxes of sunglasses. And I will never forget. I will never forget this exchange. He just looked at me and he goes, Oh, that's right. You're a Christian. And, and I don't know how he knew I was a Christian. I hadn't, didn't really have a lot of personal interaction with this guy. But somehow, you know how it works. People know. Whether they're talking about you in a derogatory way or not, it doesn't matter. This guy knew I was a Christian. And in that moment, he connected the idea of personal integrity with my faith. It was a witness to him. People are watching you. People on the job, people in your neighborhood, people at school, on the sports teams. Oh, man, I failed. I'll never forget that one time when the ref pointed at me. You, be quiet. (laughs) People are watching you. They were all watching. No doubt these guys and their faith in God was a witness It was a witness even to their brethren. Those who felt like the compromise was no big deal. I wonder how many hundreds of thousands, even millions of people have read this story and been ministered to. Here's what it's like to take a stand for the Lord. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to have a life that's, that's compromising. Four uncommon or four common youth caught up in captivity, but demonstrating an uncommon faith. You know what? This is what the world needs to see today. They need to see this. I would say they're crying out to see this. Faith with no compromise. Faith that causes no unnecessary offense. Oh man, guilty as charged. Faith that rests in the power of God. We're trusting God with our lives. And faith that's victorious. I think when we have this kind of faith, when we demonstrate it, God gives us favor. He gives us favor in Babylon, and our world is impacted. Have you made up your mind? Are you going to be like Daniel? Are you going to be like Joshua? Are you going to be like these other guys, the unnamed guys? Right? There's, there's a whole host of unnamed Hebrew youth. There's no mention of them. They're not celebrated. They haven't instructed anyone. They just went by the wayside and said, eh, yeah, this is no big deal. Yeah, that's no big deal. We'll just compromise. We'll just compromise. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, which is really, you know, it's really what this is all about. It's, about. it's about trusting God. Again, Daniel wasn't sinless. He's an example because he made up his mind. I'm going to trust God. If you haven't come to a place in your life where you are trusting Him, you need to. You, you need to trust Him. We're, we're separated from, as humans, we're separated from God because of sin. Uh, The Bible says that our sin has made a separation between us and Him. And and Jesus has come that that we might have a way back into relationship with God. But our sin needs to be dealt with. 
Our sin needs to be dealt with. And we need to bring it to Him. And, and, and that sin might just be compromised. If you're a Christian, that sin might be compromised. It still needs to be dealt with. You need to repent of it. You need to ask Him to forgive you. But if you've never asked Him to forgive you, you need to do that. You need to make up your mind to follow the Lord. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, I just, I'm going to pray. And as I pray, if you want to pray along with me, it's just a simple prayer of putting trust in Him. Father, thank You for Your Word today. God, I thank You for the examples that we have of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were surrendered to You. They trusted You. And Lord, we want to do the same. We want to make up our mind. With our, with our mind, with our hearts, we want to turn to You. We want to ask You to forgive us of our sins. Lord, maybe even for the first time, but uh, if there's some sin of compromise that we've been involved in, Lord, we want to just lay it at Your feet and ask for Your mercy and Your grace. We might experience Your forgiveness and that You might set us to work for Your kingdom and we would be witnesses for You useful in your hands. We ask these things in Jesus' name.